all of you folks out there in the audience, please. <laughs> Pardon me. Silent you farts. And don't make the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Nine o'clock, I'll open this session. Morning, Ann. Morning. Hey, Ann. Morning. Now, we just had a, a new, a few additions. Correct. Do you want me to read those off? If you would, please. Um, Mr. Hobble is going to present to you the bridge connection to emergency services from the Sheriff's Department. Um, we have an MOU with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the contract for the HVAC award. And we have a time item at 9 o'clock of School District 7 update. Superintendent Sean Gallagher, it's 9 o'clock. But we'll go on down until he provides. Do we need a day Borman up here? And Rick, is Rick coming? He's, he's not coming. Okay. I can go over his okay, if you spray would. bid. Rick received three bids, and he is recommending the low bidder, which is Mark P. Hanson Crop Production Services Timberline Division. And this is for his annual uh, spray and herbicide. And they're all listed in our packet as to what's what. He had one bidder, uh, Tony Marlowe, that didn't bid the whole project, and so he didn't qualify. And uh, the other bidder was higher. And that was uh, the River Ellis Company. So I will make a motion to approve this very good recommendation as presented. A uh, motion has been made to approve the spray bed. That's the uh, not just the spray bed uh, recommendation from uh, Roadmaster, and that would be to Mark Hansen, uh, Crop Production Services, Timberline Division. And the amount is thirty-three thousand six hundred sixty-three point fifteen cents. I'll second a motion. Uh, any other discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Oh, we'll go to the HVAC. Cool. I am here to uh, recommend. Uh, to award the bid to uh, Professional Heating and Cooling and get your uh, approval. No. Can't for the audience on the camera. Can you tell, give a layout of what this HVAC is intended to do? And it's, to, it's, it's to heat and cool the second and third floor of the courthouse. From every office space to, so we can get, you know, for one, we're not putting the air conditioners back in the windows and it's just more, uh, uh, we're going to look for just, it's going to be a better system than what we've had in the past and it's going to save us dollars in the long run with heating fuel and more energy efficient. More energy efficient. Yeah. Really yeah. Yeah. A year plus ago we had HVAC for the jail and this is basically for the rest of this side of the courthouse and into the yeah. new. Yes. And we'll yes. do the uh, whole library. And just the upper floor and this floor, not the... There's already a system downstairs that's already been put in place before I was here, and it's still uh, a good system. So mm -hmm. we decided not to go with new heating and cooling in that uh, area. And you went out with the request for post for proposals. We received the proposals back. We went through a vetting system, a small committee evaluating the bids, yes. uh, numerous items involved in, in the bid selection. Yes, we went with a criteria or a criteria that we do a scoring criteria, and <clears throat> we go through we go through each individual bid and, uh, and rank the criteria, rank the criteria of what they put. Put in front of the proposals. Yeah, and that's different than a low bid competition. Yes, yeah. you need the criteria to set it. Yes, it was a design build, and uh, we felt that professional heating had the best design for what we wanted. I think that's the criteria. That's to meet the criteria. 
So what you're after today is the uh, you want to make this award, and, and you also want to uh, get approval to go forward with the contract. Yes. To get started. And I know we've had these discussions multiple times, and the contractor happens to be here, but I, I will talk to you, Dave, about this. We have had the discussions, and I'm sure when we do the contract, you'll talk about them as far as the scheduling goes, because it's not uh, going to all be done in one fell swoop. Uh, plus, we're going to have some priority areas because of the, the warming weather over other areas. Yes, the contractor and I have discussed scheduling, and as it says in the contract, it, it will the contractor will go by the schedule that the proposed that we propose, or when we put one out proposal in the time frame, and the the contractor is very aware of uh, how we're doing it phases and time and that. So right now, it's in front of us to work a bit, and then you'll work on the contract with the to finalize the contract. Yes. I'll make a motion that we approve the uh, award of the HVAC system to professional heating and cooling as presented by our property facilities manager. I'll second the motion. Do you have a dollar amount? Uh, yes. One eighty one six thirty nine. I'll second the motion. All in favor? Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. And I'll make a motion that we approve the contract that's been presented uh, with any changes that might be necessary. This says was done in conjunction with legal counsel. I think it's good to go, but uh, we do need to get contract signed and get to moving on this. Second. All in favor? Aye. Hi. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, anything better than an air condition stuck out of our new windows. <laughs> It'll be a good system. It will be. Appreciate it very much. Hey, Sean. Yes, sir. Come on up and chat with us. Okay. Give us an update of All School right. District 7. We can certainly do that. Thanks for having me. Good to see you guys. Yes, you too. Yeah. Lots of things going on at the district. Never a dull moment. <coughs> um, here's a copy of my recent, uh, most recent superintendent message. Kind of touches on a lot of topics. Well, Mr. Gallagher, I know you're going to cover a lot of things today, or uh, You'll probably cover this, but I do want to get to the seven point three five five billion dollar budget and the concerns. And I don't know if it's around early learning. We are working with our yeah. legislative reps on, and we're hearing good things about by the close of the session, maybe a bump in that budget. But we're open. Yeah. Yes, we're open. Okay. So the seven point. Um, I'm not sure if it's seven point three five or seven point two five. Seven point two five. I think seven point two five. Yep, you're that right. package um, has passed the Senate and the House. I do believe it's still waiting for the governor's signature. Um, <clears throat> we've been doing a lot of cost analysis with that package throughout the state. And basically the, the consensus throughout the state amongst all the school districts, including the Oregon Department of Education, is that anything less than 7.5 um, is not exactly a positive cash flow for the school districts. Um, and each district is a little different in terms of where their financial status is and how it's going to affect them. We're still putting together our budget figures to know exactly what it's, it's going to mean to us. But if you compare what we need in terms of roll of costs with where the budget's going to be, we're about $183 per student shy of where we, we are projected to be or what we need to uh, really have a break-even type budget. A 7.5 package would, uh, from our estimates, pretty much take care of, of a, a break-even point. Um, I know there's different things being discussed off the side with, with attached with the budget. Um, uh, part of that budget uh, solution is that, based upon the main revenue forecast, if there's an upswing, then about 40% of that increased revenue is supposed to go to K-12 school districts. So. All cross our fingers and 
toes, and hopefully we can see a nice little bump there. Um, and by May, we should know more exactly where we are at as, as our uh, school district. Um, we're still trying to dig ourselves out of the hole created by the recession. And uh, we still have a lot of things that we want to do and need to be doing. Um, it's really going to be, be tough trying to build back anything with the current budget. The other thing with, with the, the current budget proposal is the last 200 million of the 7.25 is dedicated solely for full day kinder. In other words, you can't access that unless you have a full day kinder program. And that last 200 million can only go to full day kinder. The statewide estimates to implement full day kinder are about 200. Well, for the audience, when they say kinder, you mean kindergarten? Kindergarten, yes. The uh, estimates statewide to implement full day kindergarten is around 280 million. So whether the 200 million will actually take care of it or not, uh, it's still an option for districts. Um, so and there might be some districts that choose not to uh, implement full day kindergarten. Um, for us, our scenario is is one of two <coughs> choices. The first choice is you can deal with, um, I'm just going to call it theoretical cuts at this point. You can deal with theoretical cuts and implement full day kinder, or you can still deal with those same theoretical cuts without full day kinder. And sometimes that's a difficult message for people to, to hear and to see and to, to feel, because if you're having to cut back on one end, but you're implementing a new program on the other, you know, sometimes people say, oh wait, that, that doesn't feel right. But it's based upon how the, the legislation was formulated at the state level, and you know, our board has not made the decision yet whether to implement full day kindergarten, but um, I think my stance, and uh, I think it's shared by a lot of our administrators, that uh, it's really and truly in the best interest of kids to go full day kindergarten. We've been piloting full day kindergarten out at Union Elementary for about three years now, and we've been seeing some tremendous results. And uh, boy, it really helps those kids, uh, especially the ones that are coming in that uh, don't have a, a solid uh, background already, whether it's sociability or academics, reading, um, the full day kindergarten program is very favorable for them. So doesn't that, I, I don't know because I, I'm not involved with directly with early learning, but doesn't that fit with the goals of early learning? Yes it does. Yeah. Yes it does, absolutely. And uh, I don't know what other discussions are going on at the state level in terms of early learning. Um, the discussion that I've had throughout the state with other superintendents, school board members, uh, people in, in educational leadership revolve around that we really need to find a good solid funding source for the early learning component. Um, there's a lot of research that, that is very favorable in that, that arena and uh, sometimes just piecemealing things together is not always your best solution. And so I think that discussion is still occurring. Um, with the current state of affairs with, with this, the K-12 budget, though, I, I'm, I'm fearful that there, there may not be much movement in that direction. The other thing to consider is on the other end, um, you know, Dr. Gutierrez and I uh, uh, and a lot of the other leaders in Klamath and Lake Counties have been kind of on the, the forefront of the Advanced Diploma Program. And that's actually afforded through a loophole in K-12 funding that says if we have a fifth year student, we can still attract um, ADM funding for those students, and that's how we pay for their tuition and their books. Well, that, that loophole is up for debate at the state level right now. And if, if I was a betting man, I would say that it's probably not gonna pass. Uh, Dr. Gutierrez is, I think, being incredibly innovative in coming out and saying that KCC is, KCC is still gonna fund the program. For one, more year, right? for one more year, and I think they're going to see how it works. I think they got some pretty innovative funding streams identified. It may involve some financial aid, um, things of that nature, but uh, we'll have to see how it works. Um, we had four students sign up for an ADP program this year. We're down to one, uh, which is it's just kind of normal. Um, and then for next year, I think we have a total of ten that have signed up for it. We know that there's others following in their footsteps that you know, we, we fully expect that program to continue now, growing as long as it, it is available for them. Now, as far as the state legislature closing that loophole, do you know the rationale? 
Why? The rationale is that you have the K through 12 funding pie, and it's really meant for K through 12, not K through 13. Mm -hmm. And so that's the that's the, the struggle that people are having is you're taking away from that K through 12 funding stream, and it really needs to be something that's funded elsewhere. Um, so that's a you know it's kind of likened to the, the, the discussion on the other end of the early learning funding. Right. It, it really need if we're serious about 40 40 20, and we're serious about a pre prime primary through graduate school continuum, we need to fund these these types of programs find the funding funding stream for that. So yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with uh, Senator Witsit in regards to this. He's a strong proponent for increased uh, funding for K through 12 schools, and uh, which I really really appreciate. Uh, of course, there's politics and mm -hmm. going on. Well, I, I can honestly see that the rationale for not mixing the ADP program with the K through 12 well, financially, I can too. I can too. keep those separate. I think they yeah, room, mm -hmm. they keep their identity yeah. a lot better. Just I hope that they find a replacement right. for it. You right. know, but I have the same hope for the early learning too. Yes, I mean, both of them really need to be yeah. funded yeah. appropriately because they're pretty powerful. Um, KCC has had some tremendous success with their ADP program with the Klamath County and Klamath City School Districts. And uh, there's a little bit of tweaking that still needs to happen. Because um, they're noticing that a lot of kids are participating in the program and then rather than continuing on with their education, they're jumping out directly in the workforce. And uh, that's not really the goal. You, you want to give them that boost they need and have them that continue, transition. Yeah, have them continue to finish that certificate in certified welding or that double A degree or go on to Oregon State and get their bachelor's degree or, or wherever they choose to go. So there's there's some tweaking that we're talking about in terms of the program, trying to connect career pathways uh, to the program a little bit better so, so students can see what the continuum looks like. Mm -hmm. Gee, I need to when, you know, a jump in is just not your your free school. It it, it needs to uh, be attached to to uh, the achievement of, uh, of some sort of an outcome. The other thing is, we just re, um, I noticed you're looking on the last page there, mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner, and uh, that's a, a listing of the associated funding streams with the Innovation and Learning Center. In other words, we're we're up to about 2.68 million in value, and that's direct and indirect funding. And you just have to keep that in mind. But one of the, the top ones that is listed there is a $500,000 grant that came through the uh, um, Oregon, Solutions. Oregon Solutions and uh, SCOA <coughs> out of governor's office for the finished work on DMS Northwind. And that directly ties into the ILC. And um, I was asked the other day, why aren't you, why aren't you, Sean, why aren't you going out for funding for the, the, for the directly affects the schools? And I say, well, there isn't any of those funding sources, but there are funding sources associated with the ILC that if we receive funds on that, then we can offset the cost. So in other words, I'm not going to my business manager right now and asking for a cool 500000 to go finish DMS Northwind. It's funded through a grant. Another part of that, of uh, some of those associated funding streams is a $380,000 USDA grant that KCC received and a $300,000 Meyer Memorial Grant that our school district has received. And a large part of those grants is to pay for the expansion of the footprint of the ILC throughout Lake County. And through the, the uh, installation of additional synchronous uh, sites. So there's going to be another synchronous high-speed video conferencing site at Lake District Hospital, another one associated with the ILC, another one at Paisley, and another one at North Lake. And if you think about that, that kind of completes our network. And so now we can deliver higher education to students throughout Lake County. It also really uh, expands our dual credit offerings at, La at Lakeview High School. Uh, because right now we have, we've been really working hard on, on expanding the number of dual credit offerings for kids. But it's, it's solely dependent upon getting your instructors, instructors approved to KCC. And there's some ORSs and some legislation that are connected to that. And some instructors are getting approved and others aren't because they don't have the correct uh, degrees and background. So 
this third synchronous site that's going to be associated with the ILC is really geared at secondary dual credit. And KCC is going to be changing their schedule to where it aligns with our high school schedule and teaching classes of, of courses that we can't get our instructors to be approved for. And so it, it's going to take our dual credit offerings that we have right now and possibly even double or even triple in the next year or so. And uh, we have a, a, a senior that's going to be graduating this year that is going to be, I think, within like three or four credits of his double A degree. Think about what that's going to do to that young man. And with this additional synchronous site and the increase in dual credit offerings, I, I predict in the next three to four years, we're going to see a lot of students crossing uh, the stage at Lakeview High School with a diploma in their hand, and if not have one in their hand, but probably a certificate that says you're like three credits shy of a double A OT degree. I mean, that's, that's just a tremendous boost for them. And, uh, you know, combined with our scholarship offerings, the ADP program, if you kind of think about that, that continuum, that vision, that's really going to provide some tremendous opportunities for our students. And as a result, I predict we're going to see a lot of students in the next three or four years entering college as juniors. Pretty amazing. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. So I took you off of your schedule presentation. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. Um, on the front page, you see the school report card ratings. Uh, we're very, very proud of the achievements that our, our uh, schools are achieving. Also, you can see our uh, four-year cohort and five-year completer graduation rates. Um, we're some of the highest in the state. <coughs> um, the four-year cohort rate is actually down from about 88%, and uh, we're predicting it's going to jump right back up this year uh, to 88 89%. The dropout rate, um, uh, I don't think I listed it there, did I? You talked, talked about, about it, but I didn't list it. Well, the dropout rate went up just slightly, and uh, as a result, we've been paying a lot more closer attention to our graduates this year, and we're on the track to another 0% the dropout rate for this year. And uh, so we're pretty excited about that. <coughs> you know, when we've talked about that before, you can have, that takes into consideration other entities that are uh, working with the district as far as getting GEDs or... Uh, the five-year completer rate does, yes. Yeah. yeah. So the student gets their GED and it counts in a positive manner. Also, the ADP program, um, through the Innovation and Learning Center project, it, it attracted enough attention by Dr. Nancy Golden, the Chief Education Officer, that we were able to get that, that ding removed from the five-year completer rate. So if, when a student participates in the ADP program, it's not counted against your graduation rate. I do have to ask one question to go back. When we talk about the ADP program, we had four, or we're down to one. We made the comment that that's to be expected or that's normal. Or it is. So 25% retention in that program is going to be the norm? Well, I wouldn't say 25%, but, but having students jump out of the program is going to be kind of the norm because okay. of the students that you're serving with that program. Great example. My, my youngest daughter, Samantha, graduated. A couple of years ago, 67% of her graduating class from Lakeview went on to college. Well, it's the other 33% that didn't. Those are the ones that need to be taking advantage of the ILC. And oftentimes that 33% are the ones that, that uh, they might be first time or first generation college students, or there might be other things going on with family dynamics or, or funding, or um, it's, it's, it's a different population. And so, um, they've noticed it on the, even over in Klamath County, the same thing is, is kind of occurring there. Um, just because you're, you know, you're 4.0 GPA Harvard bound graduate, they're going regardless of whether you have an ADP program or not. But the ADP program is kind of geared to, to, uh, to uh, for those other students that may or may not be heading to college. So are, are the city schools in Klamath turning things around? Because I know they had a real serious dropout rate number. And I, I don't know. I know they've been doing a lot of things with the Klamath Pro Promise Project. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know what their stats are right now. But well, it's, it's got to make a positive effect. I mean, with yeah. the work that they're doing.
building. Yeah, I picked up something in the paper a couple weeks ago that there is a positive trend. Yeah, yeah, it, it's got to be because I, I'm every time I go over there, I hear more people talking about going to college or finishing their certificate and whatever, and, and that that's going to interpolate in the higher graduation rates. So, uh, let's see. This spring, Smarter Balanced. Uh, this is our first <coughs> official year of Smarter Balanced assessments tied with our Common Core State Standards. Um, we piloted a lot of Smarter Balanced assessments last spring. Um, there's still a big question mark out there in terms of how it's going to transpire, how it's going to work, are we going to be able to get the assessment scores in a decent amount of time. Um, one of the problems with this new assessment system that's going to require a lot more labor in terms of grading them. Um, the, the Oaks assessments that we're moving out of were pretty much automated to where a student could, when they finished their exam, they could see within seconds, excuse me, see within seconds on the computer screen whether they passed or not. But with the Smarter Balance assessments, that's not the case. There's a lot, a lot of written logic that's going to have to be graded by humans, and that's going to take some time. And so we're a little concerned about the turnaround time because you want to be able to use those scores to for school improvement. And if you don't have those scores for a few months, you don't have solid data to figure out, gee, where are we excelling, where are we deficient, and uh, so we're a little concerned about that aspect. Now, you mentioned that there was a segment that had the uh, human judge on logic or such. Mm -hmm. Who are the judges and what is the consistency across the state? That's called inter-rater reliability, and that is a big concern right now because we don't know who these readers are. Yet, Oregon Department of Education has contracted with the Smart and Balanced Assessment people to provide that, and we don't know what the plan is at this point. And we do know that there's a, there's a, a training curve that, that needs to occur. So if you have five people grading, you want to see reliability between those five. Yeah. And so if one person comes up with a score of a three and the other one comes up with a score of a one, that's not good if, if they're grading the same assessment. Right. So <clears throat> that is still a big question mark, too. It's a big question. Yeah, it is. So this is, uh, this is just the start. <laughs> Another adventure in the world of public education. Yeah. Uh, facilities, boy, we've got a lot of stuff going on facilities. Soccer field, uh, we should be finishing that up this summer. There'll be sod uh, laid down. We're working on sidewalks. Rotary uh, Club is still uh, providing the funding for that project. <coughs> solar, we were going to install a solar farm um, uh, right next to the district office this summer, but that's been delayed for one year because it uh, looks like we'll be able to attract another 200000 from Oregon Energy Trust for that project but we've got to delay it a year for that to go through. And so what we're going to do this summer is we're going to do a lot of the groundwork. We're going to do the prep work. Uh, we're going to move the greenhouse from its current location over to between the high school and the middle school. And uh, so a lot of that prep work will be done this summer. Then the next summer you'll see the, the solar panels go in and uh, we'll go from there. That'll be a big, big cost saving for you. Oh yeah, I mean just the greenhouse alone and we'll be able to hook it up to geothermal heat. For us. Of course, we're going to be uh, doing the, the DMS North Wing Finish project, which is all grant funded. Um, we have we hired a bus mechanic this year, and he has been just doing tremendous work for us. And the reliability of our transportation fleet has increased exponentially, the safety has increased, and the cost to maintain the buses has decreased exponentially just because he, we have him on staff. We're not paying the going market rate. We're also able to get parts for like 40% less than what we were paying before. I can get my truck into a mechanic shop without waiting in line with two buses in front of me now. Yes, that's true. It's not, it's not uh, creating a bottleneck. So, uh, but we need, to, we need to create a facility. And so we're still working on that aspect. Um, I want to try and combine it with some education pieces so we can start with diesel and auto mechanic uh, courses. And if we include the education piece with this facility, 
there's going to be three different grant funding sources we'll be able to access, so we might be able to get the whole thing paid for, including the equipment. So, what type uh, of mechanic can uh, offering this we we'll have now? We really don't, other than small engines. Small engines. And but small engines is the, the the precursor to the large engine type stuff. And in fact, that's how we would build the facility. We would have a small engines portion of it off to the side, and then. Uh, some bays for you know cars or a bus to be pulled into or whatever. Uh, we also want to work uh, collaboratively with KCC on developing this too, and because uh, again they have a tremendous program over at the main campus. But if we could you know start with those foundational skill type classes, um, that'd be tremendous. We've got a lot of kids that are interested in that. Now on KCC, and if we can dovetail in that, would you have? Uh, classroom video in the bus shop itself or would the kids need to come over? I think that's it? always a possibility. That's a good question. I haven't gotten that far in the conversations yet. It'd be nice to have it right there in the same laboratory. It would. It would. Uh, we went and visited some facilities in Bend and Redmond and took a look at what they're doing and how they're using their space and I've got some great ideas on what the facility should look like, uh, approximate costs, so we're, we're kind of fiddling with some designs right now. We're also fiddling with where the location should be. Um, you know, if we put it over the district office, now you got the, the travel time issue with the kids. We're, we're kind of wondering if we shouldn't be putting it closer to the ILC over on the secondary campus and having it over there. But then, you know, you have bus mechanic efficiency issues. And so we're, we're still trying to figure out what is the best course of action with this and, and what we can afford, what we can't. Some of the grants haven't been, the RFPs haven't come out yet, but we're expecting some, some RFPs to come out, so we'll have to take a look at that to see how that would transpire with this project. But that kind of is the, the vision there. So as we look at higher ed opportunities and the vision of the ILC from, you know, numerous folks over, over the time, mm -hmm. have we had any discussions, even though Preliminary discussions would probably be premature somewhat, but at least the discussions with Red Rock Biofuel, with the mm -hmm. Almost Gold, mm -hmm. the ongoing uh, energy producers from mm -hmm. geothermal to solar for mm -hmm. our KCC and, and mm -hmm. District 7 component to mm -hmm. start educating our young mm -hmm. people in those. We have an, an ILC governance committee now and so the discussions have been revolving around just that. And I have a phone call in to the head gal for the, the, the gold mining project. I'm going to tour through the uh, district here very shortly. And I want to have that exact same conversation with her. How can we provide some workforce development and education for people that are employed with those, those particular entities? Well, before ILC was named the ILC, she's sitting back there, uh, Anne and I had <coughs> numerous discussions on the opportunities, you know, with higher ed, mm -hmm. the higher ed institution specifically focused on what we have, you know, mm -hmm. for, for mm -hmm. opportunities in, in the education component, because we've had mm -hmm. community college presidents, I know, Commissioner Kessner probably remembers back when TVCC's new president came in and asked us, what, what do we need to be teaching? And those are the very things that you know, we, we believe that the community colleges in particular should be focused on. And we've got such a tie-in with our local school district, and mm -hmm. it's a great opportunity. Oh, it is. It is. And the good news is KCC has uh, actually brought two more people on board for the ILC project here. And one of them is focusing on community ed, the other one is work, focusing on workforce development. And they've been having discussions with Warner Creek Correctional Facility, um, some preliminary discussions with Pacific Pine. Uh, they're trying to branch into that area because that, we know that there's a huge need there. And there's also a, a, a great market uh, opportunity there. And so, yeah, it, it, you want to develop the whole yeah. continuum, the whole picture. It's not just about dual credit for secondary kids or, or AOT degrees. You know, that workforce development, that community of pieces. Here. Well, and, and I know we're headed that direction, but, you know, from the outside, someone wouldn't think probably it was wise where we've invested so much time and energy into this educational institute and opportunities. 
to educate our young people to have to go somewhere else to find a job because that's what we're educating them in. So, right, you know, right. I think we're all on the very same page. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. And, and that's why uh, SCOED continues to prioritize the Innovation Learning Center. In fact, we put out some minutes and meeting notes the other day, and I shared it with the board last night. And right on there was yep. Innovation Learning Center. And it's, it's, a, it's a great economic development project. It really is. You have a lot of uh, attaboys to you and Dr. Gutierrez and Jim Wallace. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's been a team effort. You know, now, Jim, the, the, the school board, you, your support, you know, it, it really has been a team effort here. I always say there's two things to civilization, education and communication. There you go. Education meaning knowledge, communication meaning sharing that mm -hmm. knowledge to yes. a place. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it makes a difference in people's lives. Yeah, it does. Huge difference. Now, you touched a little bit on a governance body for the ILC. Yeah. I've been kind of waiting for that for a couple of years. Yes. And give yes. a little structure. You bet. Um, the, the Lake County School District Number 7 Board of Directors has approved a structure for an Innovation Learning Center Governance Committee. And uh, The governance committee is mainly charged with looking at the ILC program as a whole and making recommendations to the Lake County School District Number 7 Board of Directors on, gee, we should be looking at this, or we, we recommend that, or you know, they're kind of looking out on behalf of the school district. And that's different than the, the KCC Lake County um, Advisory Board. That, that board is just simply solely looking at the KCC components in the program. Um, and we, we know that because we're a non-taxing district, we have opportunities outside of KCC, but we certainly give KCC first rights in, in terms of programming. But if there's programming that KCC is either not interested in or can't deliver, you know, that there's nothing that behooves us from going and reaching to OIT or Oregon State or, you know, something of that nature to uh, complete uh, the program and, and uh, deliver the programming that we need and desire. And so that's really what the ILC Governance Committee is, is formulated with doing. One of the other discussions that we're having right now with the ILC Governance Committee is, gee, should we formulate a 501c3 or not? You know, from, from Jill, Jim Wall's standpoint in terms of fundraising, it makes a whole lot of sense. From the school district standpoint, we're not quite sure yet. We're, there's still a big question mark there. So, <coughs> That's another one of the topics that we're discussing and we're kind of batting around and figuring out. Another thing with the ILC Governance Committee, like you said, is communication. Um, we uh, encountered some, some rumors that were floating around the community a couple months ago and they just simply weren't true. And so we put together a communications <coughs> package and Jim Walls, Christy Twait, and myself have been uh, delivering that message to different groups throughout the community and just saying, here's the facts. Here's what's going on. Um, you so know, you really probably disappointed a lot of folks <laughs> when you threw the facts out there. Yeah, it's yeah. disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so <laughs> difficult to absorb. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's con contradicted. Yeah, I know. Too much too much. You know, Christy Twait, she was so proud the other day, she said she had, had reached the, the 70 student mark for this term. We've got over 70 students that are participating in coursework at the ILC right now. And that's not counting our high school kids. And that continues to grow. And in fact, Lonnie Chavez and I just met with even our elementary staff last night. And we, we delivered the dual credit message to them. And we talked about the ADP program and all those opportunities that, that our secondary students have with the ILC that's associated for it. And boy, you should have seen the, really? So it is, it how close does she work with COIC related to job openings? You know, it's not an employment agency over there, but they work closely with the headquarters in Klamath. Lonnie Chavez? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Christy Twitter. Christy. With COIC related to, you know, we've had reports from COIC in the past, yeah. updates on unfilled jobs, not necessarily minimum wage, but unfilled. Right. right. Yet the employment unemployed numbers, you know, remain relatively high. Right. As as the discussion would relate to the opportunities to, you know, perhaps get some of those folks 
that are coming over for services or job search, mm -hmm. just a little bit of technical training Absolutely. that might qualify them for those postings. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what their connection is right now, okay. but that's something I might I'm answer that just to see yeah. how she's coordinating and connecting on that. Yeah, if she isn't, she needs to be. Yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. place where you can find out what some of the other needs are. Absolutely, absolutely. Last but not least, I have a little bit of personal news. You guys have been calling me the the old guy for in the county for a while. Something of that nature. Seven plus years. Yeah, I've been here eight years. Eight. Um, I've just been named the new superintendent of Brookings Harbor School District. So I will be moving on July 1st. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Okay, that's... I will be sad to leave here. You've been an asset here. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And, uh, Something about the coast draws a lot of our folks. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of attractive over there. But uh, a lot of the work I've done here, they want me to duplicate over there uh, with the Ohio State. And there is actually a, a community college sister facility over there for uh, Southwestern Community College. And they, they don't really have the programming streams like they should. And that's one of the projects I'll be working on when I, when I head over there. Well, they'll be taking your knowledge, your education, and communicating it to them. And communicate to them, absolutely. But, uh, so it's been a great tour here. You know, everybody I've, I've met and worked with here is absolutely tremendous. And, and uh, sometimes there's, there's opportunities that, are, that come along, and this is a larger school district, it gives me a chance to go to the next step. Well, that's what keeps it young. Yes. So, the school district will be uh, looking here shortly for a, a replacement. And the good news is there's a very strong mark of the superintendents on, out there right now. And I really feel confident we'll be able to find somebody. I really do. Well, congratulations to you and your family. Thank you. So, that house will be taken again for a short while. Yes, it will. The house down below me. Yes, on my house. Uh, quick question on recruiting teachers. Yes. Uh, are we pretty much up to speed on how having all of our slots filled and everything? And what is the challenges of recruiting teachers? Good question. Um, recruitment is one of those things that I worked on quite a bit when I was mm -hmm. first came here. And we did a lot of things to increase our recruitment. And we took our applicant base that was oh, maybe 8, 10 people all the way up to 55, 60 people, and which was a, a real positive for us. And then the, then the, re the recession hit. During the recession, there were so many people that were on the market looking for teaching jobs. We really backed off on a lot of the recruitment pieces because suddenly we were attracting two, 300 applicants for every job that we posted. Well, since the recession is starting to reside, and particularly last year, the valleys opened up and started hiring teachers again, we noticed we went back to what we were eight years ago. So we've we ramped it up again. In fact, we have our administrators on the road uh, last week and even in the next couple of weeks to different job fairs. And we have a lot of brochures and we've got a nice display. And, um, they're out interviewing and talking to people and networking and, and you know selling the attributes of Lakeview and, and our school district to uh, people out in the teaching job market because you know as we all know sometimes people don't understand the attributes of, of Lakeview so we're seeing we're seeing some good return on that and we're seeing the number of applicants in the positions that we have open right now rising again because of that. Um, it's hard to say where the market will be for this year. I think everybody's still kind of waiting to see how this state budget pans out. There might be some districts that are cutting teaching positions. Um, other districts will be hiring. I think we're going to see kind of a smorgasbord. And so all, all of that is competition for available teachers that are out there. Did we reach out beyond the state boundary? Oh, yes. Oh yeah, in fact, our new choir teacher we hired out of Michigan, I do believe, and uh, she's been a tremendous hire. 
He's just doing a bang up job with our band and choir program. I always like to give a uh, local force choice, but it's nice to get new blood from different it regions. Is. It is. You know, if, you, if it comes down to two applicants, one is out of community and one's in and they're equal, of course we're always going to favor the, the, the local. But uh, we do we do it owe to, owe to our students hiring the very best. And that's been something we've been dedicated at for a long time now. And we're, we're certainly seeing some tremendous returns for that, you know, uh, just talent based in the classroom. Well, hand in hand with that, how is our retention? Still competitive. Um, I got to tell you, it, it comes down to whether you have either family here or a spouse. Those, those that are single struggle and they tend to move on. Yeah. And that's what, what it really comes down to. Or if you hire one that's already married, how their spouse does living here. You know, I've been very fortunate because my wife has, she does great here. She loves it here. But uh, we've certainly hired teachers in the past that have brought their spouse and their spouse doesn't do very well. Again, we're noticing that pattern. And it's nothing new. I mean, I hear from the hospital, I hear from the prison, <coughs> from the federal government, <coughs> and the federal government, you know. Um, we do have a lot of programs that are designed and geared to recruitment and retention at Lake County School District. One is our tuition reimbursement program. Not all school districts have that, and that's a tremendous benefit for our teaching staff and our administrative staff, too. Um, that helps with recruitment and retention. Um, for those that have, have kids, our scholarship programs, again, another tremendous recruitment and retention benefit. Um, so there's things of that nature that, that really help in that capacity. Another program we've been very uh, adamant about and maintaining is our teacher mentor program. And that's for any new teachers coming into the district. We assign them a veteran teacher that's been here for some time, or sometimes it's even a retired teacher that still is in the community. And they become their guide. Whether it's they need a professional guide or a cultural guide, or gee, where do I buy socks and underwear in Lakeview? Just anything. And we've, we've seen some tremendous benefits from that. It's been a great investment. Um, sometimes it's been grant funded, other times the district has just picked it up just because it's the right thing to do for our, uh, our staff, and it really helps with recruitment and retention. Thank you. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for your time. Uh, so you have Rotary one of these times. Yes, hopefully tomorrow. Uh, I'll be out of town tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Anne, you've been waiting patiently. Let's cover the uh, camera. So every year, um, our assessor turns in a grant application to the state of Oregon based on assessment and taxation costs that the county incurs. And this uh, motion today approves the grant application amount of $745,210. Once the state receives all these applications from all the counties, um, then they have a total cost throughout the state. And then the delinquent interest um, program distributes back out to the counties based on a percentage of these applications. So our costs are $745,000. Uh, we're looking at next year's CAFA grant back to Lake County in the neighborhood of $130,000. This uh, application, like I said, is assessment and taxation. So they um, have a process where they look at you know, obviously the assessor's department and the cost for operations there, but they look at the clerk's department and the cost for the BAFTA appeals. They look at um, the technology department and our network costs. They look at uh, paying the bills and payroll, so they look at business services. Then they look at my time for distributing taxes as well. So this is a pretty um, wide cost um, allocation process to really look and see what this costs us. So with that, I'll make a motion to approve the grant application resolution in the amount of $745,210 as presented. Uh, second. Motion to be made and seconded to approve this grant application resolution. 
in the set amount. Is there time essence on signature? It's okay for today? Yes, in fact, this has to be submitted before May 1st. Yeah. And so that's why today's meeting, um, it needed to happen. Paul, if I... Aye. Along those lines, if through our budget approval process we make significant changes to any of those departments that I named are included here, uh, Larry has 30 days to make an amendment to this application from May 1st. So yes, to the end of May to submit any changes. Yes, we have, um, I think there's four budget resolutions to discuss today. I was really surprised when I looked at my list that these are the first we've done for this fiscal year. So our budgeting, um, I think because of more accurate numbers throughout the course of time, but then also probably resource availability has made our budget process a little bit more smooth. Uh, it's nice to not have too many changes. So. Mm -hmm. But these are all um, needed at this point in time. I'll just kind of start numerically here. The first one, 2014-05, is in the matter of an appropriations transfer. Uh, this is in the courthouse department, so Fund 101, Department 105. Uh, there's more salaries expense than anticipated due to insurance coverage. Um, there will be less materials and services. So overall, the expenses stay the same. We're just going to increase salaries appropriations and decrease materials and services appropriations by the amount of $6,000. We um, were careful to double check the salaries for next year's budget in this department and hopefully we get it right for the 12 months for the next budget. Kind of feeds over into the next one, too. Yes, 2014-06 um, is in the matter of a contingency transfer at the Fair Board or Fairgrounds Fund 211. Um, they will have more salaries than anticipated due to their new organizational structure. Uh, the Fair Board um, felt the need to have two full-time staff. When that hire was made and the people were put in place, insurance also changed there. And so this is a combination of two full-time staff and the insurance coverage that affected the salaries budget. With this being a contingency transfer, um, again, total expenses stay the same, just taking $11,500 from contingency. That's from the Fairgrounds contingency. Fairgrounds contingency, this is all within Fund 211. In looking at their budget, they actually had um, the possibility of addition, unanticipated revenue. Their revenues are going to come in higher, but it didn't look like I could state that for sure for June 30th, and so contingency was available. Mm -hmm. We're out of budget, see? Yes. 2014-07 is in the matter of unanticipated revenue. This is at the airport fund 401. They will have more fuel sales than anticipated. If they're selling more fuel, it means they also have to buy more fuel. And so we have to provide the authority and the appropriation level for them to purchase the fuel. There's another issue, though, with the uh, Connect Oregon 4 project. Now we're moving into Connect Oregon 5 with the FAA component. The timing of those projects uh, requires us to have more capital authority as well. Um, really what happened is the Connect Oregon 4 project went further into this fiscal year than we had anticipated. So this resolution um, takes unanticipated revenue, $88,300, increases materials and services by $26,000, and increases capital, $62,300. I'm I will be having to watch this through June 30th. Um, if Tom has to purchase another load of fuel, we might be on the edge of his materials and services appropriations. Um, as we start Connect 5 and what gets paid out before June 30th, I might be on the edge of the capital too. So I'm, I'm not sure that this is the only resolution you're going to see for the airport fund before June 30th. But it's all good. All outstanding. I think the improvements made at the airport have been 
great. It sounds like um, we're seeing more use of our airport, whether people are going to fly-ins or they just know that the facilities are being improved, so it's a better stop to fuel up here. Um, Tom's keeping the fuel cost, well, his fuel price very competitive in our region. Um, so we are seeing, we're seeing it over time that those fuel cells are increasing. And kind of as the economy gradually improves, yeah. a lot more people are getting back to flying. Yes. Well, and on that same vein, Ann and I have, of course, saw this year's proposed budget that's coming up, but <coughs> we are looking at having additional fuel storage out there, significant additional fuel storage and fuel sales, depending upon the, the fire season. Yeah, so when you look at that budget, that's the thing with it is, yeah, we're going we're gonna to anticipate something in fuel sales and anticipate something in fuel, inspec in fuel expenses, and then you just... You know, you're yep. not sure yep. how that's all going to turn out. All budget is uh, best estimate. It is best estimate. You may be, it, to, to someone that doesn't understand operations, though, they're saying, whoa, you're increasing your materials and services $100,000? Well, no, <laughs> we may not. It depends on fuel sales. And I just threw that figure out. That's not yep. what we're looking at. But um, it, it, if it's not well explained, it yeah. can raise some eyebrows. Yeah. The next one is 2014-08. This is in the matter of appropriations transfer again. This is at the Roundup Association for their fund um, 213. They have, and will have more capital expenditures than they anticipated. They did some more work on the roping arena. Um, and then they will also have less materials and services. So again, overall expenses stay the same at $213,550. We're just going to increase capital $500 and decrease materials and services by $500. And Hugh assures me there will be no more capital expenditures made this fiscal year. So, come on, Hugh. Yeah, Hugh has always been an asset on the financial part. I'll take a motion if you wish, sir. Yes, uh, I suppose we want to do these all separately. Okay. Main financial. We'll take the first one then. I'll, I'll make the motion to approve resolution 2014 05. I think it was very well explained, so I'm going to suggest that that resolution say as presented. Okay. A second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 I'll make a motion that we approve resolution number 2014-06 as presented. I'll second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'll make a motion that we approve resolution number 2014-07 as presented. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. And I'll make a final a motion that we approve resolution number 2014-08 as presented. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All motions carries. Thank you, Ann. Thank Thanks, you. Ann. We'll get this to you in a few minutes for your signature. Okay.
the addition is a bridge connection uh, between the uh, <coughs> EIS system that we've installed here in the share. Uh, this would be our connection. Um, it's our fiber connection between the courthouse and the 911 emergency yes. station. Mm -hmm. The one that we have now is very yeah. kind of well, completed and it's not working. So. Sean, you have something for us? You're not building anything, right? Yes. Yes, sir. Were you using that? Yes. Basically, this is to connect our EIS module computer system here at the sheriff with the 911 station, the emergency station. Mm -hmm. And it cost uh, $23,358.22 to get that fiber connection back to wireless broadband to uh, finish that project. You have anything? No, I'm just trying to re. I know we talked about using some of the existing approved budget to do this, and then they would come back. But I'm trying to read if that's what they're actually saying here, because it says this would be in addition to the in addition to the approved budget amount of seventy-eight thousand, which would bring the project total to one hundred one thousand. What isn't mentioned on here is where that twenty-three thousand to come from. He had that in another budget that he wasn't using. I don't remember what, what project that was that wasn't going to happen this year. This connection, just so you know, is not limited to EIS. It's limited it's to broader. just 911 services, period. Mm -hmm. So yeah. <clears throat> EIS cannot move forward without a bridge connection, but it's not the only reason for the bridge connection. But as far as the funding of twenty-three thousand three hundred fifty-eight and some pennies, it's already in. Oh, it was shares. for the evidence building. Maybe. For the evidence building. It's something to do with evidence building. But. So it's just shifting money from one project to another. It's now a new general fund. And that's project. that's what I originally thought. So yeah, if we did there, then I'm ready to go go forward. I make a motion that we accept the, how do you call this, EMS connection with the, uh, between the sheriff's office and 911, but it's broader than that. It gets it out into the field, control rigs, and so forth. <coughs> and the addition of the transfer from evidence, I assume, uh, building funds to this cost here of 23000 plus. I'll second it. Any other discussion? No. All the present, aye. Aye. Um, the other thing is, we have for, as an addition is a memorandum of understanding or MOU between Lake County and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Heart Mountain Refuge. As a cooperating agency, over a year or so ago, the refuge came to us and they was going to start their process of updating their comprehensive conservation plan, CCP. And the Board of Commissioners wished to have the county interjected in that planning as a cooperating agency status. They are now beginning to initiate that planning process. And this is an agreement for that cooperating agency status. <coughs> I did read it yesterday, and I will make a motion to approve the MOU uh, unless you have on it draft commissioner, if there's anything that's needing to be changed uh, no. after we approve it, then that, that would be with that approval, that I will make that motion. Motion made and seconded to accept the MOU as a property agency agreement with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. You have a final document there. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And a second. Yeah. Motion carries. Hopefully this is a little more productive <coughs> than the endeavors I incurred as a cooperating agency with the land management. It's mostly to input into the planning process the social and the economic interests of the county into their plan. Uh, with the Bureau of Land Management, they kind of downplayed a little bit on the social and economics and didn't get too
too much headway on that. Hopefully we have better interactions on this one. Yes. What are the meeting minute dates? March 4, March 10, and March 17. Didn't catch. It. Didn't catch. <laughs> did, did you break a finger? No. Lucky <laughs> for you. I know shockingly enough. Well, oh, I didn't break it. You're trying to find a nail? <laughs> so, the only meeting that reviewed was the 17th. What was the other ones? March 4th and March 10th. You two were at all three meetings. So, I'll make a motion that we approve March 4th, 10th, and 17th. Motion been made a second, and I'll second it to approve the minutes of March 4th. 10th and 17th. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion's carried. Well, so uh, Jake going to be here for an update? He is canceled. Any liaison updates or such? I don't have anything specific now. No. Uh, I'll be gone tomorrow on a family medical. I'll be back on Thursday, Friday. Next Monday, Tuesday, I'll be at a Sage Grouse ODFW rulemaking committee in, on Monday, and then a land conservation and development grouse rulemaking committee on Tuesday. Okay. I'll be up north. Uh, I'll be here this week and, and next, but I, I will be up north possibly on Thursday up in the north end of the county. So. And Denise is going to be gone after some time today for the rest of the week. Right. Essentially, down from Friday, depending on how long my fleet manager's meeting takes. There's no, <coughs> no, no real conceivable way you'll be back. <laughs> That's a long time. It is. Yeah. Uh, just another little update and kind of spin off from uh, Superintendent Gallagher on early learning this two bills that addresses early learning in the state legislature, the Senate Bill 213 and House Bill 3380 that are addressing the funding of the early learning hub programs and so forth. Uh, I went to testify in front of the Ways and Means Education Subcommittee a while back. Uh, I don't know if I made points or not, but uh, Why did that? I got to ask you something because I actually ended up watching that. And uh, why did they make you wait till last? They have a a uh, listing of sign in, mm -hmm. and they went through the listing, and there was a big long listing. They got about this far and was running out of time. So anybody that wasn't 100 miles or greater was bumped up to mm -hmm. fill that last slot before the session ended. Uh, we've had time to watch it. I don't know if I did anything good or not. Anything else for the good of the order? Adjourned.